fasting has been practiced for thousands of years, but only recently have we started to put it to the test. Using fasting for weight loss back in the 70s, was it safe? Uh, was it effective? Proponents speak of fasting as a cleansing process, but some of what you're purging from your body are essential vitamins and minerals. Heavy enough people can go up to 382 days without calories, but no one can go even a fraction of that long without vitamins. Scurvy, for example, is diagnosable within as few as four weeks without any vitamin C. Beriberi, thymine or vitamin B1 deficiency, may start out even earlier in fasting patients, and once manifest can result in brain damage within days, which can eventually become irreversible. Even though fasting patients report problems such as nausea and indigestion taking supplements, all the months-long fasting cases were given daily multivitamins and mineral supplementation as necessary. Without supplementation, hunger strikers and those undergoing prolonged fasts for therapeutic or religious purposes have ended up paralyzed, comatose, or worse. Nutrient deficiencies aren't the only risk. Reading about all the successful reports of massive weight loss from prolonged fasting in the medical literature, one doctor decided to give it a try with his patients. Of the first dozen he tried it on, though, two died. Now, in retrospect, both of the two patients that died started out with heart failure and were on diuretics. Fasting itself produces a pronounced diuresis, meaning loss of water and electrolytes through the urine, and so was the combination of fasting on top of the water pills that likely depleted their potassium and triggered their fatal heart rhythms. The doctor went out of his way to point out that both of those who died started out in severe heart failure, and both had improved greatly while undergoing starvation therapy. Small consolation, since they were both dead within a matter of weeks. Not all therapeutic fasting fatalities were complicated by concurrent medication use. At first, he did very well and experienced the usual euphoria. His electrolytes remained fine, but in the middle of the third week he suddenly collapsed and died. This line of treatment is certainly tempting, because it does produce weight loss, and the patient feels so much better, but the whole killing people thing must make it a very suspect line of management. Contrary to the popular notion that the heart muscle is specially spared during fasting, the heart appears to experience similar muscle wasting. This was noted in the victims of the Warsaw Ghetto during World War II in a remarkable series of detailed studies carried out by the ghetto physicians themselves before they themselves succumbed. In a case entitled Gross Fragmentation of Cardiac Fiber After Therapeutic Starvation for Obesity, a 20-year-old woman successfully achieved her ideal body weight after losing 128 pounds fasting for 30 weeks. After a breakfast of one egg, she had a heart attack and died. On autopsy, the muscle fibers in her heart showed evidence of widespread disintegration. The pathologist suggested that fasting regimens should no longer be recommended as a safe means of weight reduction. Breaking the fast appears to be the most dangerous part. After World War II, as many as one out of five starved Japanese prisoners of war tragically died following liberation. Now known as refeeding syndrome, multi-organ system failure can result from resuming a regular diet too quickly. See, there are critical nutrients such as thymine and phosphorus that are used to metabolize food. So in the critical refeeding window, if too much food is taken before these nutrients can be replenished, demand may exceed supply, and whatever residual stores you still carry can be driven down even further with potentially fatal consequences. That's why rescue workers are taught to always give thiamine before food to victims who had been trapped or otherwise unable to eat. Thiamine is responsible for the yellow color of banana bags, a term you might have heard used on medical dramas used to describe an IV fluid concoction often given to malnourished alcoholics to prevent a similar reaction. Anyone with negligible food intake for more than five days may be at risk for developing refeeding problems. 
Medically supervised fasting has gotten much safer now that there are proper refeeding protocols. We know what warning signs to look for, and we now know who shouldn't be fasting in the first place, such as those with advanced liver or kidney failure, porphyria, uncontrolled hyperthyroidism, and pregnant and breastfeeding women. The most comprehensive safety analysis of medically supervised water-only fasting was recently published out of the True North Health Center in California. Out of 768 visits to their facility for fasts up to 41 days, were there any adverse events? Yes, 5,961 of them, but most were mild, known reactions to fasting, such as fatigue, nausea, insomnia, headache, dizziness, upset stomach, back pain. Uh, they report only two serious events and no fatalities. Fasting longer than 24 hours, and particularly three or more days, should only be done under the supervision of a physician, and preferably in a live-in clinic. In other words, don't try this at home. This is not just legalistic mumbo-jumbo. For example, normally your kidneys dive into sodium conservation mode during fasting, but should that response break down, you could rapidly develop an electrolyte abnormality that may only manifest with nonspecific symptoms like fatigue or dizziness, which could easily be dismissed until it's too late. Therapeutic fasting for obesity has been largely abandoned by the medical community, not only because of its uncertain safety profile, but its questionable short-term and long-term efficacy. Remember, for a fast that only lasts a week or two, you might be able to lose as much body fat or even more on a low-calorie diet than a no-calorie diet. Uh, but what about fasting for treating and preventing other diseases? One of the side effects noticed in the early weight loss studies was a consistent fall in blood pressure, so much so you typically have to stop taking blood pressure medications while you're fasting, else your pressures fall too low. Once you start eating again, your pressures go back up, but remarkably not as high as they were before. But of course, it depends on you know, what you start eating again. For example, a case report of a woman who used fasting to drive her rheumatoid arthritis into remission. Uh, systolic uh, blood pressure started up around 170, despite you know, multiple blood pressure medications, was put on a whole food plant-based diet for eight weeks. That dropped her down to, from 170 down to 130, off of all her medications before starting the fast, and then normalizing down to 110 after the fast. Uh, but is that just because of all the weight loss? I mean, she lost. 22 pounds on the fast, and you know, 27 pounds on the plant-based diet. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's extraordinary to drop your pressures from 170 to 110, uh, but that was after losing about 50 pounds. Right? Uh, we've known for decades that any kind of weight loss can lower blood pressure. Uh, even minor weight loss can lower blood pressures in obese persons, even if they remain significantly overweight. Uh, but most of the drop in blood pressures with severe caloric restriction happens within the first two days uh, before significant loss of body fat. So it may also be a reduction in the fight-or-flight stress hormones, like adrenaline and noradrenaline, both before and after exercise, after just two weeks of just a a few hundred calories a day. Uh, so that may be one reason why a very low-calorie diets have been found useful in lowering blood pressures, even in those for whom blood pressure medications fail, the changes in those hormones. But low-calorie diets also tend to be more plant-based, so there's you know, fiber and potassium-rich foods, less saturated fat. Even just adding fruits and vegetables to the diets of hypertensives can lower the systolic blood pressure, the top number, by seven points. I mean, that's the kind of blood pressure improvement you might get losing you know, 10 pounds just by eating more fruits and vegetables. And if you combine that with a drop in meat consumption, not only doubling fruit and vegetable intake, but combining that with trying to slash saturated fat and cholesterol, right, you can cut pressures by 11 points. What else can we do? Restricting alcohol intake and regular daily drinkers can drop you five points, right? so uh, let's, let's keep track here. Alcohol restriction can drop your systolic blood pressure five points. Losing 10 pounds can drop you seven, uh, as can just eating the recommended eight to 10 servings of fruits and vegetables a day. Regular aerobic exercise for at least three months can drop you nine. Combine the fruits and vegetables with meat reduction, you can drop it 11. 
Blood pressure medications can have side effects, but on their own can drop pressures by 15 points. Uh, what about cutting down on salt? Uh, note in the other diet study, they kept the sodium levels the same. Cut sodium enough, and it can edge out drugs at 16. The drugs, 15. Sodium restriction, 16. Put people on a purely plant-based diet, even one you know, moderate in sodium, and you can drop hypertensives by 18 points, even after 9 out of 10 reduce their blood pressure medications or stop them entirely, all within just seven days. That's, that's pretty impressive. Now, uh, what if you took that same diet but added fasting? 37 points, right?